Welcome back, Richard. It is good to see you. Good to see you. Happy July. Happy July to you as well. And, and it's so funny because we are we are recording both in our office. Um, you're just right around the corner from me. And um, so I'm in my office, you're in your office. Um, we're not quite in the same room yet, not because um, I, I'm uh, afraid of you or anything like that, but because we, we, don't, we don't quite have our uh, a recording studio set up yet. We don't have, our, but, but we're inching closer together, right? This we is are. a gradual process. We don't want to rush into anything. It's sort no. of like an engagement, you know? That's right. It's a slow process. Right. Um, just making sure that we we match up well. So, right. Um, but but today we are going to talk. We're not we're not going to talk about how we're setting up for the podcast, Richard. We're going to talk about parenting today. Right. Um, we and we've talked a little bit about uh, some of the stuff before. We've talked about attachment and detached right. parenting before. But we're going to uh, kind of expand and and kind of get into a little bit more of the weeds with it today, um, and and talk about how this looks over time um, right. because we, we've again we've kind of talked before about this transition in parenting styles that we need to 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 follow um but we're going to provide a little bit more information about it right especially the detachment part we're going to talk about attachment parenting detachment parenting and we're going to talk we're going to spend a little more time on detachment parenting because most people know what attachment parenting is. It's what we do with very young children. We know far less about how to do detachment parenting. And that's and we do detachment parenting at one of the most difficult parts of child rearing, which is adolescence. So it's a difficult time anyway. And so we want to talk uh, today, we want to spend more time talking about detachment parenting, what's involved, how do you do it? And what do you watch out for? Right. So, you know, and so let's, we can kind of start if we start from the beginning, right, Richard. So uh, when we when we're getting ready to have a child, when right. you know, before the baby is born, um, right. this will will sort of set up some expectations. Um, and you know, one of the things that we work on with parents uh, after the child is born, typically, and and right. once they, uh, especially once the child gets into elementary school, and and if they're having any issues or anything, we talk about the difference between parenting the child you wanted. Uh, or expected in parenting the child that right. you have. And, that, and that's really rooted in the idea that um, as soon as a parent finds out that they are going to have a baby, um, man, they start setting some expectations. You know, the, the baseline expectation is that the baby's healthy. Well, that's that when you talk to parents who are pregnant, especially first time, well, most parents, when you say, well, what do you want? Or do you want a boy or girl? Most parents say, I just want this child to be healthy. I just want the child to be neurotypical, healthy, normal. I don't care about anything else. Right. Then the child's born. Right. Yeah. Because as soon as you throw that in, like, w w even when you said that, you said, you know, I just want the child to be healthy. I want them to be neurotypical and healthy. As soon as you add in that neurotypical piece, because right. again, a lot of parents that has entered into the vernacular and a lot of parents right. will use that. Um, now we're getting into, okay, so do they have some behavioral issues? Do they have some learning issues. Do they have some um, adjustment issues. Um, you know, so as soon as the child's born, now all of a sudden, parental expectations change. They sure do. Now, that's right. Now that the child's arrived, well, okay, everything's good. But what do you really want? And most parents really want their child to be obedient, mm -hmm. to be respectful. I want this, I expect my child to work hard and be a good student, to get really good at things. I want her to be a good athlete. I want her to be a good student. I want her to be dancing and music. And I, I want her to, to, um, to unfold and become this wonderful, competent, accomplished person. Okay, so it's very different after the child is born. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, another one of those things that parent, one of the unsaid things that parents uh, want is they, they want the child to do better than they did, That's they right. want the, the child to succeed and, and go farther than they did. And so this leads to expectations that will come later on down the line, uh, especially once the child is in school um, and, and they start looking at grades and behaviors in school and how far they go in school and all those kinds of things. But, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's just this a, a, a adjustment, this um, this just change that right. the parents experience that that creates some very different expectations and um, you know some different behaviors in the parent, I suppose. That's right. Not so long ago, 
um, parents lived their lives. You know, dad went to work and in my early years, mm -hmm. um, and, and this is certainly shortly after World War II, um, dads went to work, mm -hmm. mom stayed home and took care of the house and kids. And you sort of watched your, if you lived on a farm, for example, you watched your father do the, do the farm work right. and you sort of learned how to become an adult by watching your father. In industrial America, talking turn of the century, 1900 to 1950, your dad went to work. They went to a coal mine, went to a steel mill, went to a construction site. And you watch that happen every day. But your parents lived their lives. And then as soon as you could, you then lived that same life. Most of my friends' dads worked in steel mills and the sons worked in steel mills. Right. But after World War II, this changes. Okay, now these parents who went through the depression and a war, and I can't, you know, Bernie, I have a hard time that whole generation experienced the depression and this horrific war. When they came back, they wanted their kids to have a better life. Right. And somewhere in the 1940s, somewhere after World War II, everything changed. Mm -hmm. the, the whole idea of parenting changed and childhood switched from birth to roughly 16 or 17 or 18 to this 23 year exposure and training program. And we saw that. Um, in schools, in youth sports. Mm -hmm. Bernie, when I was born, there were no Little League baseball fields. Right. I mean, th those things didn't exist in those years. Schools were sort of small little units, nothing like the, the large uh, mm -hmm. schools we have today. Um, and, and in fact, the first how-to parenting book was written by Benjamin Spock in 1946. And suddenly there was this interest in how do you raise these competent children? How do you raise, what, do you, what are you supposed to do if you're interested in, in nurturing your children to become successful? Okay. Right. Now, so we went from one book, now I'm on the Goodreads, they have their 588 parenting books on their list. There are probably thousands of parenting books out there. Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and, and so again, remember that, um, you know, prior to World War II, prior to this time period we're talking about, um, you know, kids didn't go to school. Uh, most kids didn't graduate high school. They, they went through about seventh grade or so, and, and they left and they went to work because that they, they got to be the age of about 14 or 15 or so, and they went to right. work. Um, you know, those who stayed in school were those who were sort of expected to go on to college and, and continue from there. But, um, you know, that adjustment, that shift from childhood through adolescence very quickly to adulthood right. happened very, very early in those years. And now, uh, as you said, sort of that this, this gradual shift um, mm -hmm. after World War II and after, you know, the, the, these people came back from, um, from the war and everything, everything changed. And now all of a sudden, where adole this adolescence is extended, Right. Um, you know, it, it no longer does it exist just until the time that we can be independent and drive and get out of the house. It's right. um, now right. it's until, you know, until we graduate with our bachelor's degree. That's right. Uh, Maybe that's to college. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or your first job. And so so the nature of parenting really changes after World War Two and and parents no longer are just modeling what their children are gonna do, but they're actually involved in nurturing and developing and supporting their kids to become something different than what they were. My father didn't want me to do what he did. My uncles didn't want us, they didn't want my cousins to do what they did. They didn't want them to go to the steel mill. They didn't want them to go into the coal mines. So the nature of parenting changes from um, modeling what your children are gonna do to um, playing this very different role of a, of a support and a nurturer, okay? Right. Now there's, so there are three conditions in that kind of parenting. One is, if you're gonna do that, now you have certain obligations. You right. know, if, you, if you're taking on, you wanna build a person who's competent and confident and resilient, but you also wanna build a person who can manage on his or her own as soon as possible. Right. You're, right. Gonna, you're gonna be this, right. You know, if you think about that, that that um, juxtaposition, that that dichotomy there. You want to create someone who is um, competent and self-sufficient and all of that kind of stuff. Um, 
and, and that takes time and in the way that parents especially today the way that parents right. define that right. is very different and it doesn't necessarily mesh with this idea that a lot of parents have of um, they want their kid to do all these things as soon as possible right and and so to get their kid to be competent they provide all this structure and support mm -hmm. the very thing that gets in the way of kids becoming competent and independent. Independent. You know, they, they keep, it's like scaffolding. You know, you see these medieval cathedrals or churches and you see all this scaffolding around them to support what the work that's going on. But at some point you got to remove the scaffolding. Okay? Right. And that's what parents aren't doing. They're keeping the scaffolding, the support to create these smart, independent, self-sufficient people requires all the support. But it's but you also have to you also have to take the support away. Otherwise, you're never going to get to that goal. Right. Absolutely. And so, you know, so we want them to be confident. We want them to be competent. We want them to be able to fit into culture. Um, we want them to interact and engage with other people in healthy, appropriate ways. Right. And again, we want all of these things, but sometimes we want it so much that we don't allow it to develop. Right. Um, because of that scaffolding that you're talking about. That's right. So you also have this obligation to build a person who can fit into the culture. You know, you, our, our culture, our work, our business life works from eight o'clock to five o'clock. So you, you got to be on that schedule. You want to fit into our culture. You have to do that. Um, also, you have to have a person who doesn't impose on others. One of your obligations is to create a person. We've all been in the store and you hear a child screaming somewhere on aisle 10. Okay, and you hear screaming and screaming, and that's imposing on others. Parent, you have the obligation that your children don't impose on others, whether it's at home, in a grocery store, or in a classroom. You, children have to learn that. So parents have these other, op and they are obligations. I call them obligations to create children who can fit into the culture. Right. Also, parenting is a mega, it's not a marathon, it's a mega marathon. It's an ultra marathon. Ultra marathon, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it, it, because again, you know, we once thought that it was once the case that it only lasted, you know, up until about middle school. Right. Um, and now it's until 22, 23 years old. Right. Um, yeah, parents, parents, you know, you, man, it's every year. You never stop being a parent. And when right. your kids are in their 20s, 30s, 40s, you're still a parent. Um, you do it every day. There's no five day work week here. Parenting is seven days a week. And it's every hour of every day. Um, you don't get three shifts. You don't go in for an eight hour shift or a 12 hour shift. When you're a parent, it's 24 hours a day. Um, and so you, it is an ultra marathon and it requires this sort of, the kind of parenting that we're doing today requires that you be there constantly for many, many years. Right? And in part that leads to this third section of, um, right. you know, intentional parenting has these two distinct that's right periods mm -hmm. um the first half as we've uh, sort of alluded is is attachment parenting and, and this you know goes through uh, up until about the time that middle school starts maybe just into middle school and mm -hmm. this is when parents the the parents job is to is to provide that scaffolding is to sure you know, build a, a structure around the child so that they can grow in a, in a healthy, nurturing environment. Um, you know, you want them to be able to, to have these different skills and they don't have them yet. So you model it and you structure it for them um, and you help them build that. All the while they know that you're there to help them, that you're gonna catch them if they fall, that you're gonna help them get up if they fall. You're gonna, there, that attachment parenting is there to provide that emotional and, and sometimes physical support that the child needs as they're doing going through those developmental stages. That's right. And, and that sort of attachment is we, we say it's mutually satisfying and mutually nurturing. Both right. parent and child uh, derive benefit, a mutual benefit and mutual satisfaction from that nurturing. Okay. Mm -hmm. But that is going to end very early. I mean, some people say, you know, by the time a child is nine or 10 or 11 years old, this, this idea of this, this constant scaffolding and the parent is a decision maker, that has to start to change at around late elementary school. Right. And it, it shouldn't and maybe isn't too surprising that that's a right around the same time, just before the same time, 
that kids used to be com considered completely independent. That's right. Anyway, World War II. Um, so, so at this time, this is when this big transition happens. And um, you know, in in our culture, um, whether we whether we talk about um, religious perspectives, whether we talk about academic and educational and, and learning development, around this age is when everything changes. Um, you know, in in many um, religious denominations, Christian denominations, around right. the age of twelve is the is the decision making. You know, that's when the child is considered old enough to be able to make a decision for themselves. Um, you know, educationally, you know by middle school, um, if a student is having, a, you know, any difficulties or anything, now all of a sudden this student is included in all of those meetings and, and things like that. And so in, in our culture, um, broadly speaking, you know, this is the age when the child starts, needs to start taking the reins on some of these things in their life. That's right. If you look back at the three major religions, they all have some kind of ceremony mm -hmm. that occurs at about the time of puberty. 10, 11, 12, 13, but there, there's this great transition that the world's great religions already recognize, the bar mitzvah, the confirmation. Um, also cultures right. uh, will send the boys, out, though, particularly boys, you know, mm -hmm. they'll send boys out to go out in the, in the bush by themselves for three or four days and you have to do some event, some, um, some obstacle that you have to accomplish, some challenge, and then, then you enter manhood. So, so we recognize this as an, the, the significant transition from childhood to adulthood. But in our culture, we're extending that transition period that used to last a couple of years, and now we're extending it to about 10 years, at least 10 years out. Okay. Absolutely. And, and the, the real problem, you know, our, our perspective is that the real problem with that um, is is that not really that that's happening, but that what's what's going on is that we're continuing or parents continue to use attachment parenting right. after the time which in which the child needs to be gaining this independence. That's right. And because at that point, that, now you're ready for the second phase of parenting. You know, parenting, you can think of it, parenting is in two great phases, two, two large uh, phases or two large parts. In the first part, you do attachment parenting to mm -hmm. give your child security. In the second part, you have to let go and allow your child to develop independence and develop their own security. That has a that second part, what we call detachment parenting, is a completely different set of parenting skills than what you use. You can't use your attachment parenting skills during the detachment phase. Okay? Right. And that's that's I think the mistake that many of us parents make is that we continue using attachment parenting skills at a time when we should be using detachment parenting skills. We're taught a lot about attachment. We're not taught much about detachment parenting. Right, because you know the idea is that through that attachment, those attachment uh, parenting years, mm -hmm. you're teaching the child really everything that they need to have a, a solid foundation upon right. which they can stand and, and go to the next stage. And, and you know, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing really wrong with, um, with this idea that things have been extended. Um, right. you know, I, I suppose maybe we should have said this earlier, but um, 50, 75 years ago or, or longer, right. When, when you know adolescence ended and you were a, an adult by the time you were you know 16 15 16 17 years old right. um, life was different then um and and, right. and, I, and I hate to use this word but it's just the word that comes to mind um, life was more simple then um mm -hmm. there weren't as many um, threats there weren't as many the world was much bigger and so um for those reasons, people tended to stay right where they were. Um, yeah. You know, uh, you, you grew up and you lived your entire life in the same community in which you grew up. That's and right. as you said earlier, you know, they boys tended to go to work at the same exact places that their dads weren't worked at. So yeah. th life was much more contained and smaller then. Right. Now life is, you know, the world is is tiny. You know, you kids today 
10 year olds today are, ex are exposed and, and presented with opportunities to interact with people all over the world. Exactly, and um, they do. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, you know, yes, we had that same scaffolding as we did before, mm -hmm. but now we need to make sure that we still have to be involved as parents because now they're getting into the stage where they're branching out and they're going into a much broader, bigger world. Right. And, and they don't, you know, there's nothing that we do in those first 10 years that's going to prepare them completely for that. That's you know? right. So, so we have to take those basic skills that we're teaching them during that first, uh, first period so they can apply them to the rest of the, area, the areas in their life. That's right. Now, we, we, we love to talk about attachment theory, but that's probably a topic for another day. Yeah. Um, what, so what do we have to, what do you have to accomplish? There are certain milestones that your children should achieve during the attachment phase mm -hmm. so that they can, so that they can succeed at the detachment phase. Okay. And that's another major shift is that now we're, we, um, Dr. Bernie and I, are looking at the attachment phase, roughly birth to about age 10, um, as a time when parents have the obligation to accomplish certain things. Right. The first one, during infancy, you have to establish trust. Uh, you can't spoil an infant. You don't let them cry it out. Infants cry to get their needs met. You can't, you're not going to spoil an infant. And an infant is birth to one. Yeah. Because the first year of life, you're not going to spoil an infant. Okay. Right. I mean, it always it makes me like pull my hair out when when parents say, well, we don't want to spoil and, and, and you can it's the baby's two months old, the right. baby's two months old. And you're you're, you're worrying about spoiling that that's right. it spoiling um, babies, the idea that babies manipulate by their crying and everything. Right. Manipulation requires a certain level of cognitive awareness that right. I'm right. sorry, infants don't have. Uh, after the age of about one, kids start to understand some of those dynamics, and they can they can use some of that. Um, and that, that's why we get the word no so early in life, and all those kinds of things. But prior to the age of one, you're not going to spoil the baby. They, what you really need to be building here, as you as you just said, is trust and, right. and assurance. The baby needs to know that when it has a need, you're going to be there. That's right. That need. Now that's gonna change, as you said, around two, two and a half. The brain is gonna go through this huge change. It's gonna grow a bunch of new neurons. It's gonna be able to do a lot more things. And this is when kids start to become a little more independent. It's when they start saying no. It's when they, they, they're telling you, I can do it myself, okay? And so, and we have to allow them, they, we call it the terrible twos. It's not so terrible, it's just that they're more competent. So mm -hmm. when, you, when you think about a toddler, that's, that's a toddler, that's, a, that's your infant with a new brain. Right. Uh, the, 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 it's a bigger computer, allows it to do more. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you get to the preschoolers. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can start to, after age three, where you can really start to develop some expectations for this kid. Now, right. you know, th this kid can manipulate. They can, they have temper tantrums. Mm -hmm. But they also, you also need to have expectations because by age five, and if, and if by age five, your child has to be able to accomplish certain things. I mean, right. these are your mile markers. One is they have to be able to play well with others. The biting and the hitting and the grabbing, that has to end. No right. more temper tantrums. They, those should be gone. They should be able to clean up their own messes. Again, they make a mess, they clean a mess. Mm -hmm. And they also should start having some regular chores. This is when you, you don't start teenagers to do their chores. You right. start with four and five-year-olds getting the idea that they have regular chores that they don't get paid for. These, right. are not, these are not allowance chores. These are chores. You live in this house, you have certain obligations. That starts at age four and five. Absolutely. And, and what all of these things do, being able to play with others, um, you know, emotional behavioral regulation with no more right. tantrums, you know, all of these things. What this is, is socialization. It's, we, right. we want our kids to start kindergarten Right. Aware that, you know, uh, we've said this before, that they're the center of your universe, but they're not the center of the universe, that they can take instruction from other people, they can right. take guidance from other people, and that if somebody else says, no, we can't do that right now, or you need to put that away because we're going to PE right now, that they will, they can do that, they can follow those expectations right. because they're structured and ordered. Um, we want that by kindergarten. However, if we recognize that that doesn't always happen, and what the research says is that if that doesn't happen by kindergarten, 
we, we do have another, we, we sort of have an extended opportunity with that. And that Absolutely. isn't about, about third grade. Right, that's right. Uh, by third grade, kids should be able to manage school. They right. should know what their assignments are. They should right. know what homework is. They should know where their, uh, where their, where their gym shorts are. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's that's by by the end of third grade, your kid, your children should be able to manage all that stuff. They also that's why we expect them to read at grade level, to have all their speech sounds. But we also expect that they can regulate their emotions. They're not having those temper tantrums and meltdowns. If they still are by the end of third grade. If your children can't manage their own lives, keep their own agenda, know what their assignments are, and be able to regulate their emotions, there's a lot of work that you have to do. Right. Because okay? the, the end of third grade, another mile marker. Right. And by the end of fifth grade, yeah. Now, now we're looking at true independence. Okay? Right. Because let's, you know, if any of you listening have a, a, a middle schooler um, or someone, a, a child who's about to go into sixth grade or right. a child maybe that just completed the sixth grade, um, it is a major shift mm -hmm. for, to go from elementary to middle school. Um, and so by the end of fifth grade, kids need to be able to communicate with their teacher. They need to be right. able to manage things. And if something isn't right, instead of, you know, if, if they get a test back and they got something marked wrong that they think is correct, right. they need to be able to go to the teacher and say, hey, how, why did I get this one marked wrong? Um, because that's what's got to happen in middle school. That's right. Um, I can assure you, this is what's going to be expected at middle school. Right. So it's your obligation finish, to get kids ready. Absolutely. So by the time they finish fifth grade, they need to be prepared for that. And, and right. that also means being prepared to take responsibility for their actions. That's right. Um, Rich, I don't know if I even even mentioned some of this to you, this to you, but there was this uh, this past year in, at um, at a middle school that I worked at. Mm -hmm. There was this this rash of um of incidents where students were emailing uh through this program in the school they were emailing their teachers like some of them would be cursing their teachers out some of them would be saying all these mean things about their I, you know i think you're a horrible teacher yeah and then they would come back and say oh no i i didn't send that <laughs> it said everybody stops it and just like turns tilts their head sideways. What do you mean you didn't say it? it came from your email address? Right. Oh, well, you know, I, I must have left it open and somebody else must have done it. Sure. Whether that happened or not, they have to be able to take responsibility. They're still held accountable for it. So they That's have to right. be able to take responsibility and take care of their things. And so, right. so by the end of fifth grade, those expectations have to be there. Right. Was they're really going to struggle in middle school. That's right. Right. And so, they hit middle school this, this summer between fifth and sixth grade. You might think of it as halftime, you know, time to take a breath, get load up on snacks because now you're about to begin the second part of parenting that we call detachment parenting. Right. And like it or not, at 16, by the time your child is 16, they're going to get into a car. It might be your car, it might be their car, or it might be the car that belongs to a friend. Mm -hmm. but they're going to get into a car and they're going to go where you aren't. Right. And they're going to be with people who have more influence over them than you do. Right. Like it or not, that's going to happen. Unless you keep them in some kind of a bubble, which would be the worst thing you can do. They're going to disappear. This means that by age 16, they better be competent. Mm -hmm. They better be able to make independent decisions. And they also better be able to make safe decisions because right. you're not going to be there anymore. Right. Okay? And that's what you have to prepare these kids for. And if you have kept the scaffolding up too long, mm -hmm. they're not going to be able to make those kind of decisions. They don't have, you will not have given them the opportunity to make those kind of decisions. Right. So, so while most parents find attachment parenting very easy and natural, mm -hmm. um, it, is a, it is a transition for parents to move into this detachment parenting role where they're letting go. And they are allowing some things to happen. And they're right. going to, you know, they're going to have to watch their kids struggle some. Um, that's right. But that's part of it. You know, we talk about adolescence as being a time for, it's a very difficult transition for teenagers. It's also a very difficult transition for parents. 
Yeah. Because you you have to give us a completely different set skill set that you need to uh, to use mm -hmm. during this second part of your child's life, the second half of child's growing up. Okay, absolutely. Because you got two goals during adolescence. You have two goals as a parent. One is that you have to give your children the opportunity to develop their own identity, because if they don't clarify who they are during adolescence, the rest of life it's going to be a struggle. Mm -hmm. for a very long time and right. the other thing they have to do is you have to give them the opportunity for them to accept the responsibility they're going to become more independent but with that comes responsibility so it's identity and responsibility right and you do that through detachment parenting right right so so one of the things that we have to think about with detachment parenting is is the idea of of permission um right. as you were saying um, and we're not just talking about permission to, you know, let your kids go do things. We're talking more of a sort of a psychological permission. And, and that is a permission to, to, to let your kid develop his or her own identity right. um, and to allow them to then take responsibility for what that identity means. Sure. Um, you know, par many parents struggle when their kid, um, you know, starts to have ideas or beliefs or, you know, things about themselves that differ from the family's, you know, values or family right. perspectives. And part of that um, transition, part of that shifting for, for the child to go from the parent's uh, core set of values to sort of experimenting and exploring some of these other core sets of values, um, that's part of them developing their identity. And, and kids have to have the parent's permission and put that in quotation marks right. to do that. You're not going to actually say, you know what, you have permission to go off and, and you know, right. have different identities. You're not saying it, right. but you're going to have to let it happen to some extent. That's right. This is, and this is part of, it's very difficult for parents. You have to allow your child more decision-making. Right. That means you have to tolerate that they might make some mistakes mm -hmm. that they can't get punished for, okay? That, that you have to allow that there's a certain risk involved in letting your children make decisions. Right. And then the other thing, they have to express their individuality. They have to express their identity. So you have to tolerate some diversity. They may veer off from your core beliefs, whether it's religious beliefs, food beliefs, drug beliefs, it doesn't matter what it is, they're going, you're going to have to allow them a little latitude. Um, you may not like the way they dress, but it's that, that outfit that they're wearing is part of their identity. It's probably going to change, but you have to allow them the expression. Yeah. And I, I like that you said, um, you know, you have to allow some of these mistakes and everything without, without punishment, without right. some, many times. And, and oh, man, my goodness, parents have really have a hard time with this sometimes. Sometimes the the mistake, the error, is punishment enough, right? You know, um, sometimes the 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 social consequences are punishment enough. Mm -hmm. We don't we don't have to go over and above and say, okay, well, you know, because you did that, um, because you didn't, you know, do these do that project for school, you know, let me have your phone. Um, no, the 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 poor grade that they're going to get maybe may be sufficient a consequence right sufficient mm -hmm. enough consequence for a kid who's cognizant and concerning you know concerned right. about school um other kids may not care so much and taking away their phone isn't going to matter anyways and so we need to figure out some other strategies but but yes we we have to shift the way in which we think about discipline at this That's age right. uh, you, right. you you can't you can't exert the same kind of control over a 15 or 16 year old that you could over a four or five year old. That's right. Think of that. Think of those early years up to uh, through elementary school. That's the age of command and control. You're, you're in charge. Parents can make, because kids don't have any options. They're not going to go anywhere. They can't run away from home when you're nine. I mean, they can, but most aren't. Um, so kids don't have a lot of options. So there's this sort of agreement that, okay, you're in charge. The kids give up their control. When you get to those teenage years, you now enter the age of consent. Mm -hmm. and, and you say, you get kids saying, you can't make me stop unless I agree to stop. And right. that's absolutely true. Right. Um, there's, there's nothing. I mean, if the kids don't agree to stop, it's not going to stop. You may not see it, but it's still right. going to be happening. Okay. Right. 
And punishment at this age, punishment is meant with counter counter punishment. You know, okay, you can punish me, but I'm gonna get you, I'm gonna get revenge. I'm gonna punish you in return. Little kids don't do that. Okay, right. but teenagers will. Right. And, and teenagers and acknowledge that they do. Um, and, and they say, well, you know, if he did that to me, so you know, this is this is what I'll do. That's right. And so you have to replace this unilateral, well, I'm the parent. You were until about age 10 or 11. You're still a parent, but you're a different parent because now you go from unilateral decision-making and authority to collaborative decision-making and authority. This has this is a joint venture now. It's a more adult-like relationship. It's not a, you're not dealing with a child. You're dealing with a teenager and teenagers have um, have rights and response, have rights that little kids don't have. They also have opportunities. They right. can leave. They can walk out. Absolutely. And so, and, and so you mentioned two things. You mentioned permission is one. The other thing you mentioned is acceptance. acceptance. And, and the acceptance is that you, you have to, the, the ownership of their actions um, right. and the consequences for those actions have to shift from you, the parent, right. to, to the kid, to the teenager now. Right. Um, that responsibility has to shift to them. Because right. if you hold all of that, again, they don't ever have then the opportunity to be able to manage those things. That's and right. Have the opportunity to learn how to take ownership, to take responsibility. If we never give them the the, the you know the right. opportunity yeah. to take it, you have to hand them the reins. I mean, at some point, they have to hold the steering wheel. Right. You know, you, you've got to let go, and you have to let them learn how to take ownership and how to take responsibility. But that means you have to accept the fact that you're going to be giving it up. You're right. going to have to relinquish control, well, and, and you have to. It's just like driving a car, right? You, exactly. You would you would never um, just give your 18 year old a, a set of car keys and say go and when they've never driven before. That's right. You would never do that, and so we shouldn't do that with parenting either. But you have to, so you have to give them the opportunity to drive, mm -hmm. so that by the time they're going to take the keys themselves, they're competent. Right. But they have to sit in the driver's seat some. They have to make some of those decisions and make mistakes. Right. They have to be in that, that situation. Yeah. And, and at first, you provide support through a learner's permit, and you sit there and you help them. But then at some point, you're going to get out of the car, and they're going to drive off on their own. And they need to be able to, competent, they need to be able to do that independently. Okay. Absolutely. So you also have to accept the way they, the way that they are their own person. Uh, mm -hmm. This is how they're going to look. This is how they're going to think. This is what they listen to. This is it. You have to accept that they're becoming their own person, and you have to let go of that. Yes, they're going to make mistakes. Yeah, they're going to wear clothes you don't like. They're going to do hair colors you don't like. They're going to say things you don't like. They're going to listen to music you don't like. But you have to accept that they're becoming their own person. Right. And then. You have to give up your agenda for them. Well, I really wanted my child to be a football player, not play the flute in the band. Well, I'm sorry. Your agenda now must be relinquished and they must have their own agenda, whatever it happens to be, whether it's what they do in school or whether they're going to go to college or whether they're going to become a worker or whether they're an athlete or musician. It's their agenda now that you have to accept that they have their own agenda. Right. Now, it also, um, what, another part of acceptance is, is this idea of teaching competence and independence. Right. You know, um, and, and, you know, we have to accept the way, for example, that they spend their time. Mm -hmm. um, we can't, we can't structure and keep everything so tight that our kids don't understand the um the responsibility of time the the value of time um you know how many times have we talked to kids where you know they teenagers where they only do something when somebody tells them to right. so they don't they, they they don't have any responsibility at home and right. so all of their time is free time until somebody tells them to do something right. and so they they never know intuitively that oh it's time to take the trash out because nobody if nobody tells them to do it, then 
they don't know to do it. And so That's they right. have to be taught, no, this is what you do. Your responsibility is to check the trash at the end of, after dinner, after we clean up for dinner. And if it's full, take it out. Right. Um, but they have to have that responsibility. If we don't give them that responsibility, they don't ever learn. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what does letting go mean? When we say accept, what does letting go mean? Well, letting go is if you have um, too few responsibilities at home, okay, and, and we see this all the time, the kids have no real responsibility at home, well, then they have free time. You know, they're, they're, they're using, they're on their video games because they don't have anything else to do. You haven't given them anything else to do. They feel no responsibility. And so they use their time the, the way they want. What does letting go at school mean? Letting go at school means they're on their own. From right. middle school on, you, you shouldn't be monitoring every assignment. And parents continue to do that. They monitor every single assignment. Well, if you're monitoring it, that means they don't have to. Right. As long as you're willing to, they don't have to. And, and if there's a mistake and you're communicating with the teacher, then they don't have to. Um, right. But they need to be able to. That's right. That is their responsibility. That should begin in elementary school, as you said, by fourth or fifth grade. They should be communicating with their teachers on their own. OK, mm -hmm. parents have no business being right. in kids school lives after the after elementary school. That's what elementary school is for. You learn you, you, you kind of have to help your kids do that. Mm -hmm. But man, the most important thing you can do is make them independent at school. They Absolutely. have to be able to do that themselves. OK, yeah. and it's the same with other activities. Right. You know, get out of their coach's ear. Right. You know, let the coach be the coach. Right. Like it or not, let the coach be the coach. You have no business advocating for your children after they're nine or 10 years old. You should never do it in sports. Um, let the coaches do the coaching. Right. Okay. Absolutely. Let the teachers do the teaching. Let the instructors do the instruction. They know more about it than we do. Absolutely. Because, okay. again, remember that the overall goal is that by the time they're 18, by the time they're graduating high school, that your kid is able to function independently. Mm -hmm. um, they need to be able to take the keys to the car and, and go where they need to go. Right. Um, and if we don't start teaching them and giving them the, those opportunities right. when they're ready, when, they're, right. when their biology is asking for it, mm -hmm. when are we going to do it? Yeah, when, right. Mm -hmm. So okay. they, only, they only have until they're 16 or 17 or 18. Right. You know, I mean, after 18, it changes, everything changes. Right. So, so you, you have to give them the opportunity. Um, you know, the, we now run into this again that we, we, we said it earlier, you know, it's sort of like an extended time where right. we have like from 18 to about 22, 23 years old, right. where, where kids are, you know, they're off to college, but they're still sort of connected and tied, mm -hmm. you know, tethered to home a little bit. Or they're still home and they're 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 trying to get out into the workforce and they're or they're trying to to do things, but they're still living with their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, again, the, the idea here has to be that they are independent. There clearly there have to be house rules. You you can't have a 19 year old living in your house that's free to go and come and go and do whatever they want to do mm -hmm. without consideration of how it imposes on everybody else in the house. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they're an adult, they can make decisions on their own, but they're still house rules. Um, with, in, with independence comes responsibility. Absolutely. You, you can't just, you know, bring all of your friends over to the house on, on you know, right. Sunday evening um, just because you want to, um, you know, Agreed. there has to be some structure for it, right? right. Mm -hmm. right. So, so there is this, we call it trial independence, you know, from 18 to 23. We do have this period, this transition, this last transition, mm -hmm. okay? And it might be that the child graduates from high school, gets a job, but still living at home, okay? That's for a couple of years. Or they go off to college. But in those cases, the kids are still connected to their parents. So you have this one last opportunity to make them truly independent, okay? Right. Um, but that's it. The, that that window is going to close. Right. By the time they're 22 or 23, the window closes. And at that point, you really do have to be independent. They, and, and they need to be. And, you know, we do have situations and, and people that we work with where, you know, they're, they're beyond that stage 
and they're still living at home and they're still tethered and tied to home. And, and it, it's so difficult um, for them because there are so many other areas of life where they're just not exploring. They're just not um, doing what they need to do to be functioning independent adults. That's and right. so, you know, it, it, oftentimes that falls back to the parents. Right. And if you're, if you're still becoming something in your 20s, um, you're going to be way behind schedule because by the time you're in your 30s, you should be having children, you should be building a nest egg, you should be having a career. And if you don't use your 20s to start all that stuff, um, you're going to be woefully behind at 30. So you're going to put your children at an enormous disadvantage if they're not, if they're not independent early. The, and the earlier they are independent, the, the better it's going to be for them. Because if they, if they blow through their 20s and haven't made these decisions, um, they're in for a lot of uh, difficult struggles beyond that. Absolutely. So just, just as kind of summing up from today, you know, parenting is vastly different um, mm -hmm. than it was 60, 70 years ago. Right. Um, you know, kids at that time were independent out okay. of necessity. The, the, again, the world was smaller. Um, the, um, well, the world was bigger, but their life was smaller. It was, it, it was more contained. It was more tended to be more restricted. Mm -hmm. Um, but now, you know, because of the way that the world is, um, you know, we, we, have to, we have to parent a little bit longer uh, right. than we used to. That's right, of necessity. And we don't, we don't take that away. You still have to be a parent. You just have, through their adolescent years, you just have to do a different kind of parenting. Right. And that's the adjustment that parents need to make. So the, the two great phases of raising children, one is attachment parenting, and this is something we do until the late elementary, end of elementary school, where the responsibility is still belongs to the parents, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, discipline is top down. It comes from the parent to the child. But there's a mutual agreement between parent and child. The child saying, okay, I'm totally dependent on you, so I'll accept all the, all the rules, okay? And the parent is saying, okay, and I know what's best for you. So, so parent and child agree with this arrangement with the parent being in charge. Yeah. The attachment parenting is different. Right. Now the responsibility shifts to the child. Exactly. The shift to the child. And, and you know, it, so they need to be making decisions and, and uh, doing things and taking responsibility for things on their own. Um, and, and discipline shifts from parent to child to more collaborative. That's you know, right. You're working together, you're discussing things. Um, and, and part of this is that mutual agreement on what is happening where the, you know, the teenager in many ways has to accept right. what the parent is saying. You know, right. Try to get your teenager to eat something that they don't want to eat. Try to get your teenager to do homework that right. they just don't want to do. Right. And, and all that comes out of that are, are threats and, and, you know, consequences that nobody wants. Right. Um, and, and it's just unhealthy. It's just not helpful at all. It's, it's not healthy um, for the child. So there has to be this mutual agreement um, where the teen and the parent agree and, and the teen accepts what the responsibilities are. That's right. The teen is saying, this is reasonable. I, I can accept this. OK, because if it's not, they're going to push back. And that's Absolutely. the difference between young children and teenagers. Teenagers will push back. Absolutely. So, all right. I think that that's where we'll stop for today. Yeah. Um, there's some other things that we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, and expand a little bit more on uh, some of these uh, plans next week. Yeah, because uh, one of the things we know is that, you know, how should parents intervene when kids do start to move into some dangerous areas like drug use or you know, they're not doing their schoolwork and they're failing their classes. So there are times when parents do have to move in. But again, uh, that's a topic that we'll pick up um, in subsequent weeks, okay? Uh, there, there are times when parents do have to intervene, but they have to intervene in this detachment parenting way. Right. Okay? You still right. can't resort to, your kids aren't suddenly nine years old again. So. You're, not gonna, you're not gonna put your 16 year old in timeout. No. Also. All right. <laughs> All right, that's it for today. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid.